Well, if you're a Beatles fan, you recognize that song and you recognize that feeling too. There's just times in life you say, help, I need somebody. Help, I need, whether it's an outside source of power or strength, we all need help. Sometimes that comes in the form of, of people in our life that help us when we're down. Other times it's like, I've run out of resources. I need additional resources of strength, additional resources of love, additional resources of, of, of patience. But today in our brand new series, Smart Book, we're going to talk about how we all need additional resources of hope. And so today we have with us a, a friend of our church I've gotten to know over the last four or five months. His name is Ben Corson, and he uh, really travels the United States talking about this subject, how to find hope. And about a year ago, I heard him on a, a video on YouTube sharing a story about he found hope. And he found hope in the midst of a very difficult personal crisis. I thought, it's one thing to have hope when things are going well. It's another thing to have hope when things aren't going well. So can we give a warm horizon welcome to my friend, Ben Corson. Ben, come on up, man. Thank you so much. Good to see you, man. I love you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you for letting me come all the way from Oregon. This has become a real home away from home for me. And this church is a prototype for what's going to be seen in the future with churches all across the world, I believe. You guys are on the forefront of a new way to do church, and it's really exciting for me. Uh, Hope is something that I'm very passionate about because I struggled with chronic depression for 10 years. Uh, It was something that racked my heart so badly that sometimes I would just stare at walls and lose the willpower to even do anything. There were times when I was totally depleted and enervated of all energy, And it took all the willpower I could summon and muster just to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, Chad referenced a couple years ago, I went through one of the biggest heartbreaks of my life that blindsided me and left me totally in despair, engulfed by a sevenfold horror of proverbial midnight darkness. When I was a kid, my sister died in a car accident. Uh, My dad's first wife also died in a car accident. My brother, uh, the past few years, almost died twice because of brain tumors and malaria. And there are times in our life where we feel like there is no more hope for hurting hearts. The interesting thing is, did you know that millennials and centennials, Gen Z and Gen Y, is now the number one most depressed generation in recorded history? That's why I love that we are creating an empire of hope, pockets of heaven, outposts for the kingdom of God here on earth. For people who know that statistic and are choosing to defy it. People who say, I'm going to find anything that's not heaven on earth and utterly destroy it and annihilate it. Uh, My heart for you is that you would understand that the Bible is a book that is devoted to giving people hope Not in a fluffy, airy, fairy, hunky, dory, wishy-washy, pie in the sky, sunny with a high of 75 kind of way. But in the most deep and real and even smart way. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is actually one that I'm sure you all know. It's Genesis 1.1, which says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, whether or not you believe in the Bible or not, that is a pretty fascinating verse because it contains scientifically within itself Uh, three of the fundamental laws of physics. Uh, Number one, the author says, in the beginning. The word beginning is a measurement of time. Time. Uh, Then it says God created. That word create is only used of divine and never human activity in the Bible because only God can create something out of nothing, the author presupposes. So in the beginning, time, God created the heavens. The heavens speaks of outer space. And thirdly, the earth. The earth speaks of matter. The three fundamental laws of physics, time, space, and matter. Now watch this. This verse has been called the Trinity of Trinities because each one of those three fundamental laws of physics contains within itself three more properties. Time contains three properties, past, present, and future. Space contains three properties, height, width, and depth. And matter contains three properties, Solid, liquid, and gas. The trinity of trinities, the three laws of physics with three inherent components, all within the very first verse of the Bible. (laughs) 
And my heart for us is that we would understand that as we walk with, talk to, follow after, lean into the God of hope, what happens in our lives is we have the wonder restored to us. It takes a very strong person to not let the suffering and depression we've gone through leave us cynical and jaded, but rather use situations that are painful, convert them into pain of fuel to make us more childlike as we enjoy the joy of being enjoyed by God. You know, all throughout the Bible, we see the authors filled with wonder. David said, when I consider your stars, the work of your fingers, I think, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you should take thought of him? Again, the psalmist said, happy are those people whose God is the Lord, who made heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. When these biblical characters like walked through creation, it was like they were in Hogwarts or Narnia and they were filled with this Peter Pan demonium, this childlike fascination with the wonder of God's creation. My heart for us is that we would live with such hope that the wonder is restored to us again. For me, sometimes when I find myself depressed, I like to go out in the stars and just think about the majesty that God created all around me. And be grateful for every breath that is a gift. Um, I really like astrophysics if you're into that kind of stuff and quantum mechanics. When I think of how this world was constructed, it just fills me with awe and wonder. I don't know if you're aware of this, but everything in all of existence is made up of things called atoms. Now, an atom is so small that an atom is in size to a golf ball as a golf ball is in size to planet Earth. So it's very tiny. Atoms make up all things. Don't trust atoms. They make up everything. Just seeing if you're awake. Okay. Atoms, atoms are very weird anomalies. Did you know that if you blew up an atom to the size of a stadium, its nucleus would be the size of a grain of rice. That's how small its nucleus is. If you blew up an atom to the size of a stadium, its nucleus would be the size of a grain of rice, but the grain of rice would weigh more than the stadium itself. (gasps) If you blew up an atom to the size of a stadium, its nucleus would be the size of a grain of rice, but the grain of rice would actually weigh more than the stadium itself. Now, a lot of the stuff I'm about to tell you is very difficult to believe, But you can study this astrophysics when you get home if you want, or you can take my word for it because I've been studying this for the past few years. But watch this. Atoms, as you learned in school, are made up of, of, of three things, essentially, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And there are actually more than 150 subatomic particles, particles smaller than an atom, that we've discovered through a microscope. Now watch this. We have been taught in school that electrons orbit the nucleus of an atom sort of like planets orbit the sun. Now that's a good elementary rudimentary model, but what's actually happening is way more mind-bending and significant than that. Atoms, um, when they're made up of the nucleus, protons and neutrons in the center, surrounded, engulfed, orbited by electrons, what the electrons are actually doing is they're, watch this, leaping from point A to point B without traveling the distance in between. This is called a quantum leap, which is just a fancy science term for beam me up, Scotty, teleportation. (laughs) People are like, is teleportation ever going to happen? You're behind the curve. It's already happening in the subatomic world. Electrons are leaping from point A to point B without traveling the distance in between. We're about to get our minds, minds blown. Are you ready for this? Okay, watch. An electron, they found electrons. Remember, these subatomic particles, that quantum leap, They do 47,000 laps around a four-mile tunnel in one second. They move very fast, but they've actually found electrons that don't face the front when you turn them 360 degrees. To make them face the front, you have to turn these electrons 360 degrees twice. (laughs) Furthermore, they have found subatomic particles that exist in two places at the same time are everywhere and nowhere and pop into existence out of seeming nothingness. 
When you look at the weird world of subatomic particles, suddenly it starts to fill us with this wonder and say, okay, there is obviously some miraculous magic involved. Did you know through this thing called communication and quantum entanglement, they found that there are subatomic particles that can communicate with each other without any signal. So for example, if you turn a particle in LA, it will actually mirror itself in a particle that turns the exact same way in New York. So there's actually a mirroring happening over distances. When you turn a particle in LA, a particle in New York will mirror it and turn in the exact same way through this phenomena called communication. They've identified subatomic particles that come into existence and they have no idea where they come into existence from. But here's where it gets really nutty. If, if you look at an atom, it's 99.9% empty space. Now, if you take all the empty space out of all the atoms in the universe, the universe fits inside a sugar cube. An atom is 99.9% empty space. And if you remove all the empty space from all the atoms in the universe, the universe fits inside a sugar cube. What are we talking about here? (laughs) You're telling me we're not living in Narnia? No matter how much sadness we go through, how can we be inured to or numb to the wonder of everything? In fact, there's this thing in astrophysics called redshift where we can tell that galaxies are expanding and uh, the universe is expanding and moving and picking up speed as we speak. Just as you can hear an ambulance siren and by the fading cacophony of its sirens, you can tell how far the ambulance is from you. So too, there's this thing called redshift where we use not sound waves as in an ambulance, but light waves. And we can see by light waves, the redshift of any galaxy, how far away a galaxy is from planet Earth. Now, if you use the mathematical models of redshift in galactic expansion, because the universe is expanding as we know it, and you run the mathematical models backwards many, many, many years, the universe mathematically converges to a single point that astrophysicists call the initial singularity. Before anything, in the beginning, was an initial singularity that had the potential to create everything. The four fundamental forces of physics, the strong and weak nuclear forces, gravity and electromagnetism, all existed in this initial singularity and then exploded into being. Now, back then, time, space, energy, and matter were all made effectively of the same stuff, but all of the universe, scientists now tell us, fit in a space the size of a sugar cube, the initial singularity. Now watch, when everything exploded into into existence, it created something that Einstein found called the Higgs field. The Higgs field is this omnipresent force field that our bodies, particles, rub up against to create quantum drag to give our swirling, mostly empty space mass um, materialism so we can actually come into existence. That's something you're like, okay, Ben, that's a little beyond me and a little above my head right now. Even for me, I'm pushing the limits of my own knowledge. But let me say this. We live in a very wonderful, magical, amazing world. And God wants us to go back to that childlike wonder of saying, wow, Lord, look at everything you've made. I look at the Milky Way galaxy and I think there are more than a hundred billion stars in our galaxy and billions of other galaxies are known. I see in the middle of our galaxy, there is a super massive black hole that's 307 times the size of our sun. And, and when there's this star near this massive black hole in the middle of our galaxy, this S2 that comes into orbit near the black hole, it goes so fast, it goes 2% light speed. When I think of the fact that if I lived somehow near that black hole and I had children, if I lived near the black hole for a time and I came back to planet Earth, my child would be older than me. <laughs> The theory of relativity, Einstein, we actually use it in our GPS systems because it accounts for the gravity well and the, uh, and the velocity of our satellite systems. The theory of relativity is a real thing. So I think if I live next to a black hole 
and I had a child left here on planet Earth, by the time I returned to planet Earth, my child would be older than me. Amazing. Or let's bring it a little more simple. I eat in and out hamburgers, which taste like Hope Feels. I look around at flamingos, which can only eat when their heads are upside down. Or the Arctic tern, which can travel 32,000 miles, the furthest traveling migratory bird in existence. I think of the albatross bird, which can fly 25 miles per hour while sleeping. I think of kangaroos, true story, kangaroos, which can carry their babies in marsupial pouches. I say, wow, this world is full of wonder and hope. But not only is this a magical, miraculous place that we live. Furthermore, in the beginning, God created all of this. So the Bible teaches. But it's not just that God is this omnipresent Higgs field that gives us mass or this initial singularity that explodes everything into existence as the prime mover, as Aristotle said, or the ground of being, as scientists call it. But he's also such a personal God that he cares about you. Jesus said that the father counts the number of hairs on your head. So the same God from whence the initial singularity, the Higgs field, atoms, electrons, quarks, muons, subatomic particles explodes into existence. This same God who is massive and gargantuan, he cares so much about you that he counts every single hair on your head. Did you know the average blonde haired person has 145,000 hairs? The average redhead has 90,000 hairs. The average brunette has 120,000 hairs. The Bible says that not only does God count the stars and calls them out by name, but he, the good shepherd, knows his sheep by name and he counts the hairs on your head. He's a caring, caring father, not just an omnipotent creator. And I want to tell you that I believe this with all my heart. God is for you. Even in the darkest places of your life, when your heart is broken, God is there. I mentioned Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But two verses later in verse 3, it says, the first thing God ever said is, let there be light. Now watch this. This is crazy. Light, made up of energy quanta called photons. Light, the speed of light, is now, according to scientists, the one stable element in existence. The speed of light is the one stable element in all of existence. Now watch. There are 4 million photons per square meter and light is everywhere in the universe. There is not a square inch in the universe where light is not found. In fact, did you know there's light in you scientifically? The problem is You and I, the phosphorescence that is generated and occasioned in our body because of metabolic reactions in our physiological constitution is a thousand times weaker than the naked eye can register. So you actually glow even though your naked eye can't register it. So you can wake up next to your spouse in the morning and you can say, honey, you glow. (laughs) You might not look like it with your bedhead, but I'm saying it by faith because I know scientifically you do have photons. (laughs) You can say, honey, you look like a million bucks. Just if you're in England, don't say, honey, you look like a million pounds. Anyway, (laughs) but light is everywhere. It's omnipresent, even in black holes. Black holes don't destroy light. Black holes just swallow light. 96% of the universe is unknowable, made up of dark energy, dark matter, and black holes. And yet even in black holes, light is present there. So too, the Bible says, God is light. In him, there is no shadow of turning or darkness at all. If you ascend up to heaven or dwell in the depths of the sea, If you take the wings of the morning or dwell in the uttermost deeps of Sheol, behold, God is there. The question is not, where is God when your heart is hurting? That's like asking what shape is yellow. The question is, where isn't God? You can't escape him. His comfort is all around you when you tap into it via hope. Just like light, he is everywhere. Just like light, he is the one stable element in all of existence. The Bible was saying this before we figured this out through quantum mechanics and astrophysics and the study of energy quanta called photons. God is the one stable element in existence, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there are times when we can't depend on our circumstances, but we can always depend on the one Paul the Apostle called the God of hope. 
So, my friends, when we go through hard times, because we know the reality of God who is light, filling us with wonder, magic all around us, the same yesterday, today, and forever, this infinite potential for creativity who miraculously gives us materialism and mass and also creates in us this childlike wonder, intrinsic in our spirit, no matter what we go through, when we're experiencing hard times, we don't have to say, why me? We can just say, try me, because hashtag the struggle is real, but so is God. Life is tough, but God is tougher. Life Life is a battle, but the battle is the Lord's and no one ever injured their eyesight by looking on the bright side. So we're not going to complain because rose bushes have thorns. We're going to rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. Our hope is not dictated by our circumstances. Our circumstances will always be dictated by our hope. Our past supply is not our last supply. The more desperate the case, the more space for God's grace. God's love is the coal that makes the train roll. So we're going to be strong when everything's going wrong because God's love is the most powerful force in the universe. May that force be with you. And it's okay if you're not okay. It's just not okay if you stay that way because everything's going to be okay in the end. So if it's not okay, it's not the end. Let's go. There is always hope. There's wonder all around us. There's wonder all around us. And not only that, in Romans 8, Paul says, if God be for you, who can be against you? Now, we've been plumbing the deeps, kind of all base. Let's go to treble and skim off the top for a second. When I was in eighth grade, I played basketball for this team called the South Met for Generals. And let me tell you, I was terrible. <laughs> I scored for the wrong team the first play of the season. Now, I've talked to people who've shot for the wrong team, but I actually scored for the wrong team the first play of the season. I was always dribbling the ball off my feet, turning the ball over throwing the ball out of bounds. And yet, as bad as I was, at the end of the season, we ended up winning the championship game. And we had these gold medals around our necks. And man, I, along with my teammates, thought, I'm bomb.com. I'm the man. I'm the champion. But the reason we won is not because I was good. Just between you and me, I made it harder for my team to win. <laughs> The only reason we were champions, there was one sole reason. And that's because we had a kid on our team named Kyle Singler. I'm still friends with him to this day. I was texting with him last night. But when we were in eighth grade, we were champions because we had Kyle on our team. Now, Kyle would go on to play for South Medford High School and win a state championship against Kevin Love. He then got a full ride scholarship to Duke University, became final four player of the year under Coach K., got his picture on the cover of Sports Illustrated, uh, was drafted by the Detroit Pistons in the first round, became second team All-NBA rookie squad, and now he's raking in $4.5 million every year playing basketball for the South Medford, or playing basketball, pardon me, for the Oklahoma City Thunder. He's an NBA professional basketball player millionaire. He was on my team. A few years ago, I ran into my coach and I said, wasn't it great when we had Kyle on our team? He said, oh yeah, our whole game strategy was just give the ball to Kyle. <laughs> like, Ben, when you have the ball, you end up giving the other team points. <laughs> But if you focus on Kyle, you're going to win. That was Paul's a priori logic. He said, if God be for you, who can be against you? In other words, don't look down and get distressed. Don't look inside and get depressed. Don't look around and get stressed. Look up and get blessed because you're too blessed to be stressed. When you put all of your focus, all of your attention on the God of hope who loves you, who made you, then suddenly you become, um, I don't know, approximately, give or take, roughly speaking, invincible. Here's God who creates everything. He creates neutron stars. A neutron star, by the way, can weigh more than 200 billion tons and fit inside a teaspoon. True story. 
A neutron star can be heavier than all the continents on the earth put together and fit inside a teaspoon. God makes neutron stars. He makes Canis Majoris. He makes planet earth, which is 71% covered in water and 95% of our waters are unexplored. There's creatures and aliens, as, as it were, floating around in the deep seas that we haven't even discovered yet that NASA is still exploring. Here's God who made everything all powerful, all loving. He's crossing people over. He's all wet, splashing his jump shots. He's dunking on people's faces. And I say, I believe in you. I trust you. And God says, what shall we conclude from these things? If I be for you, who can be against you? We have one on our team who's braver than Batman, stronger than Superman, more indomitable than Iron Man, more audacious than Ant-Man. His name is the son of man, Jesus Christ. Let's go. (laughs) Whatever you believe about the Bible, whatever you believe about this stuff, it's absolutely insistent this smart book, the Bible is, that our Lord is the God of hope. And he cares about you. He really cares about you. What you think about God, I would argue, is the most important thing about you. Since we're here, we might as well just talk about the meaning of life. (laughs) You want the meaning of life in one sentence? We might as well go there. I believe the meaning of life is this simple. Drum roll, please. I need a physical, actual drum roll for this because this is big. Can I please have a drum roll? The meaning of life is to enjoy the joy of being enjoyed by God. To enjoy the joy of being enjoyed by God. By God. There's this verse in the Bible where Zephaniah says, God rejoices over you with joy. God does not endure you. He enjoys you. The Bible even said in Zephaniah that God sings over you when he thinks about you. He's for you. He loves you. I was talking about recently um, during an equip service how brain scans have now shown us that what you think about God actually changes your brain through neuroplasticity. Meaning, if you pray to a God that you believe is angry, then your amygdala will have high activity, which is the place in your brain which is responsible for anxiety and stress. So you will anger more easily, be more stressed, and be less forgiving, and have higher blood pressure if you believe that God is somehow angry at you. But if you pray to a God who is loving... You have high activity in your frontal lobe. In fact, prayer is one of the top three best things along with reading and exercise for your brain. If you pray to a God who is loving, you have high activity in your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain responsible for focus, concentration, and creative thinking. And you have high activity in your anterior cingulate cortex, which is the part of your brain responsible for empathy, compassion, and fuzzy feelings. You know, religious affiliation is going down in the, in the United States today. And not only that, but in the entire Western world. Did you know that uh, in Europe, less than 10% of people define themselves as religious? Now, if you're running for president and you're getting a less than 10% approval rating, your campaign is on life support. So religion affiliations are indeed going down. But research has also shown us that people's affinity for prayer is as high as ever. Deep calls into deep. Homo sapiens are actually hopo sapiens that have hardwired brains designed with the teleologic purport of praying. In other words, even if people don't define themselves as religious, people believe in prayer as much as ever. And whatever you might think about religion, let me encourage you, when you pray to a God who is love, the Bible says God is love, the God of hope, the God of wonder, the God who made everything, then suddenly you have better focus, you have better concentration and you will show greater compassion and empathy for other people. You say, Ben, okay, all this science stuff is, is cool, but what about me? Like you, I'm going through a big season of depression. Can God heal me? Well, I want to tell you now that God has given me so much joy. <laughs> fun is fundamental. He puts the fun back in funeral. <laughs> he causes the dead to raise the blind to see, the lame to leap, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak. He's a God who does miracles. I really believe this. Just study science and it's full of miracles. 
Niels Bohr said, if you study quantum physics and aren't outraged, you don't know what's being said. Werner Heisenberg, who discovered the uncertainty principle, he said that you cannot predict both the position and momentum of a quantum particle simultaneously. Heisenberg, the famous quantum physicist, said, this is my favorite science quote about God. He said, the first sip of the natural sciences will make an atheist out of you, but God is waiting for you at the bottom of the glass. I need to say that again because that's sick. The first sip of the natural sciences will make an atheist out of you, but God is waiting for you at the bottom of the glass. Newtonian physics says everything works according to law and order until we discover the microscope and we're like, the subatomic particles are not going according to everything that we had predicted they would do. And God is so full of wonder and magic and miracles, the Bible teaches and science affirms. But can he heal my heart too? Did you know the phrase a broken heart? which we use in our rhetoric and syntax every day, or maybe not every day, but very regularly. The phrase a broken heart was invented by the Bible. The first time humans ever recorded the phrase a broken heart in writing was in the Bible. It traces the genesis of its origins back to ancient biblical Hebrew literature. 900 times the Bible speaks of your heart as the sum, the seat, the center of who you are, the nexus of your emotional existence. And God promises I will heal the brokenhearted and I will bind up their wounds. I am nigh to the brokenhearted and save those who have a crushed spirit. Whatever your opinion of Jesus might be, let me tell you in his own words why he came. In Luke 4, 18, he said, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. I know that today antidepressants are the number one best-selling prescribed pharmaceutical category prescription medication in a nation built on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're stressed, depressed, distressed, and in debt trillions of dollars to China. I know that suicide is one of the top 10, lead, 10 leading causes of death. There are 123 suicides per day, a.k.a. Anthony Bourdain, Kate Spade, these icons who reach the top of the corporate ladder and still feel an emptiness in their souls. I know that depression is prevalent in our generation and that suicide rates have increased by 25% nationally and that USA Today said that suicide is now a national crisis. But I also know that our God is capable of healing broken hearts because he did it for me. When you turn your cares into prayers, your stresses into supplications, your worries into worship, your panic into praise, when you turn your fear into faith in your father, the Bible says a peace will come that surpasses all understanding to guard your hearts and your minds. Let me explain. I remember when I was a a kid, I used to get beat up by this bully on my block all the time. Her name was Christina. And I was really obnoxious, had a high voice, didn't inherit my dad's muscles. Nothing has changed. So kids would often want to beat me up. But whenever somebody wanted to beat me up, all I would do is I would run into the presence of my dad because we lived three houses away from the school. And my dad, when I was a kid, was a dead ringer, a doppelganger. He looked exactly like Chuck Norris. This was before the Chuck Norris jokes. He, he, he looked exactly like Chuck Norris. He would walk down the street and people would say, Walker, Texas Ranger. And it was just my dad. He had the beard, the muscles, the physique, the stoic expression and calm. He had this Chuck Norris look to him. So whenever my bullies wanted to beat me up, by myself, I was frightened and I ran. But when I stepped into the presence of my dad, who was three houses away from the school, I just ran home. My dad would sometimes be in the front yard mowing the lawn in his bro tank. Sun's out, guns out. (laughs) Then suddenly I changed my tune. (laughs) I'm like, you ain't so bad now. You got a problem with me. Take it up with him. You have to go through those muscles to get to me. In the same way in life, when you're bullied by fear and anxiety, when you go into the presence of God and you pray to a God you believe who loves you, neuroscience tells us you'll have greater focus, concentration, less mental clutter, less anxiety and stress, more peace. But also you can know that God will fight battles on your behalf. 
He will fight your anxiety and your stress when you turn your cares into prayers, casting all your cares on him for he cares for you. So I want to encourage you to be strong today. To know that God is for you today. To know that God is with you today. To know that God is love. Be a man. Quit yourself like a woman. Do not be afraid. Fear is bad for you. Fear releases more than 1,400 known physical and chemical reactions in the body, triggers more than 30 different hormones and neurotransmitters. It's really bad for you. <laughs> Don't give in to fear. Rather, trust God by faith. And you watch how peace and strength will come. I want to close with a video in just one second. And after this video, I'll make one closing remark and then we'll be on our way, almost on time. And uh, this is a little clip from our TV show called Hope Generation, which actually was on TV this morning on Hillsong. And I just want to encourage you to take in this poem that has changed my life. Wherever you come from, if you like literature, this is going to be your jam. Because in this poem, we're going to learn that we have the resources God has planted within us to be strong, even when everything is going wrong. Let's take a look at this video. I'll make a closing remark, and then Chad will come up and we'll be on our way. This poem changed my life. It was written by Rudyard Kipling, the author of The Jungle Book, and it's called If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think, but not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you. If all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Paul the Apostle said, quit yourselves like men and be strong when everything's going wrong. Would you stand with me? I believe that you have the resources that God has put inside you to be strong no matter what you're going through. If God be for you, who can be against you? Culture eats ideology for lunch. You go to Switzerland, God's a banker. You go to Germany, God's a policeman. You go to America, God's a capitalist. But no matter what culture says, the Bible says through all times, God is stable. God is love. That's who I believe he truly is. He is love He is for you. He wants to restore wonder and take away that jaded mindset that can so easily creep in. So my friends, throw water on the fire of your fears and throw gasoline on the passions of your dreams. You will have nightmares and you will have dreams, but you will overcome your nightmares because of your dreams. Wrong will be worsted. Right will triumph. You are baffled to fight better. You sleep to wake. You fall to rise. You might have hell around you, but you've got heaven inside you. So we're going to be the people who have gone through hell carrying buckets of water for those still consumed by the fire. 
and we're going to be hope dealers in our generation. Let's go. Would somebody please say amen? <laughs> amen. Let's welcome Chad. He's going to close Thank us you. out. Thank you, Ben. Well, grab a seat for just one minute. What we're going to do at the end of uh, each week of the series is we want to give you some tools. You know, the Bible doesn't necessarily seem like a smart book. It seems like an old, uh, archaic book. But actually, there's a lot of tools that can help you. As you heard uh, Ben talk today, he talked a lot about hope. So how do you find verses about hope? So each week, we're going to highlight a different tool. Uh, this is one you can use uh, on your uh, uh, browser. If you type in Bible Gateway into your browser, this is a tool I use all the time. Many of our small group leaders do. And you say, hey, I'm looking for a verse about hope. I'm feeling discouraged. I'm feeling depressed. You can just type here into the main uh, keyword search, hope, and it will immediately pull up different verses from the Bible. If you scroll down, the first one that jumps up is from Romans 5.4. If I click on that, it'll show me the little piece of the verse. If I click on full chapter, it'll pull up the full chapter. I go up and say, hey, what does the Bible say? I'm going through a difficult time. I get here to verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory, which means to give weight to our tribulations. In other words, when I'm going through a difficult time of tribulation, I'm going to give weight to something else. What is that something else? He says, I'm going to give weight to my tribulations, knowing that this tribulation is going to have a purpose. It's not meaningless. It's going to produce perseverance in me, and perseverance, character in me, and character, there's the word hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So this is an idea of a verse. When you're going through a difficult time, you think to yourself, it's never going to get better. It's permanent. It's pervasive. It's affecting every area of my life. The whole world's falling apart. But instead to focus on and to lean into hope, God's going to use this. God's going to use this trial. I've got the hope this isn't meaningless. So that's one way you can use Bible Gateway to look for verses. Let me go back to that list for a moment. You can also look on the right-hand side. It filters it by book of the Bible. So, for example, I'll say, hey, any verses in Psalms? Psalms are a series of journal entries that people have written about their struggling with God. Well, let's hear some of those. I'm going to click here on Psalms. You see lots of Psalms pop up on the left side. Psalms 1-6, six, Psalms 16-9. I can click the verse, or I'm going to do the whole chapter, 16-9. And I might say, well, I want need something I can put on my mirror, something I can put on my, um, uh, on my dashboard, something to remind me during the day to have hope. So let's jump down to verse 9. Started a little bit earlier. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. I'm going to keep that focus because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. Therefore, because of that fact, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh will rest in hope. You might say, well, I love that verse. I've got to remember that verse. If you highlight it, this little highlighter comes up. You can change it to different colors. So you remember it next time. You can click the little arrow here and email it to yourself, Facebook it to yourself, print it out. So this is one way that you can go looking for verses, and it can be any subject, keywords from the Bible that you can use in your own journey. Or if you're not really a Bible reader, you're more of a listener, I'll give you one more tool on Bible Gateway. Go up here to the top left corner on Bible. If you click on Audio Bibles, you can say, well, I wish I could just, while I'm doing some work around the house, while I'm working out, listen to some Bible. You click on that. We'll do that verse right there, which was Psalm 16 in the book of Psalms, and you just hit play. Psalm 16. And now, while I'm working out or anything, I can just listen to the verse. It's dramatized with different voices of actors that play it, different noises in the background that really bring it to life. So hopefully, each week we'll highlight a different tool. But this is a tool I use all the time in my um, research, in my own personal life, as well as for preparing for uh, sermons for the Bible uh, here at Horizon. So if this could be helpful for you, there's a lot more tools embedded in there. But this can help the Bible go from being some book that lays on the coffee shelf that I never read to a smart book that can help you in your everyday life. So let's uh, close in prayer, and we'll say one more thank you to Ben before we go. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for being a God of hope. There are many here going through some tribulations and trials. And they don't know if they're going to persevere. And they care a lot more about comfort than convenience. And I can relate. I'll take convenience and comfort over character any day. But God, will you remind us that you care so much about us that you're developing something more long-lasting than comfort and that we can have hope that these trials will produce the kind of character that make us into the very best version of ourself 
as you are present with us. And out of that hope, we can face depression. And out of that hope, we can face fear. And all this, Father, we ask that you would draw near to each hurting and brokenhearted person here today and let them know, whisper to them if you could, I am with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give Ben one more thanks for being here today? Ben, thank you. Appreciate it, man. And we will see each one of you next week for week two of SmartBook. Thanks for being here today.